Hello, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work we're doing at ATB around uh, robotics process automation and AI. Uh, and as mentioned, my name is Dan uh, Simmons, um, and I work at ATB. Uh, in the past, I've been working on uh, robotics process automation for the last couple of years. Uh, most recently, um, I'm now the head of uh, artificial intelligence uh, for the bank. So. Uh, it's my like third day on the job, I guess. So uh, you can ask me lots of hard questions. Okay, so we're uh, we're doing quite a lot of uh, work at ATB on artificial intelligence uh, overall. Uh, for example, we were the first uh, financial institution to deploy a Facebook uh, Messenger bot that did simple banking transactions, and that was over a year ago. We're also using machine le learning capabilities to improve our risk uh, and fraud models, but. Um, I wanted to talk to you today specifically about um, our uh, AI and RPA capabilities that we've deployed for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we have quite a lot of them working right now in production, uh, over 50 end-to-end -end automations that we have. Uh, and secondly, I think it's a good uh, kind of use case to kind of illustrate the capabilities as an ecosystem to enable really transformative end-to-end -end change uh, and create some pretty cool uh, customer experiences. So. Um, we started working on uh, robotics specifically, robotics process automation uh, in 2017 April, so almost two years uh, now. And uh, like many organizations, we started with a proof of concept. Uh, ours, uh, what we picked was what we picked was a uh, specific process in our back office. We, we set out with the objective to really improve the customer experience. Uh, but when we started our POC, we, we picked an area in our back office that was contained in scope uh, and really allowed us to kind of stay tight and understand the capabilities uh, in terms of how they would work uh, within our uh, architecture and to the extent that they could meet our needs to kind of transform the experience that we, we wanted to. Um, when we started working on this a couple years ago, um, at the same time uh, as starting with that original proof of concept, we uh, asked for a quote from our, uh, some of our vendors and our partners in technology to do the same process, but basically automate it through our enterprise service bus uh, into SAP, which is the core banking system that we run. Um, and the quote that came back, is that the alarm? That means we have to... All right. The quote. All right. So the quote that came back uh, at the time uh, to do that body of work through uh, sort of an API integration uh, into SAP uh, came in at around six months for three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. We were able to do the same automation at a period of six weeks for fifteen thousand with the robot. So uh, it was a pretty good uh, value that we could see in terms of the use case, and from there. Uh, we were really keen on um, essentially prioritizing our backlog uh, based on our top sort of manual processes that were negative VOC drivers, and then uh, in terms as well of the, the viability uh, of the processes to work uh, with solutions like RPA. So that's kind of how we uh, started off. We spent the remaining eight months of that fiscal year um, deploying around 24 automations locally in our back office. That allowed us to kind of uh, learn the ropes, so to speak, on how to make RPA work, but also uh, start to interact with our workforce and understand the change impacts from a human capital uh, perspective. So we deployed 24 automations in a period of eight months. Um, we didn't see uh, the, the type of exponential um, experience change that we wanted to see for our customers, and we understood that. Um, and one of the main reasons we didn't see that is because we were seeing a lot of uh, exceptions. So we'd have these automations up and running. The ones that went through were great. They were running uh, demonstrably faster in terms of responsiveness to customers. But we were seeing as much as a 30 to 40 percent error rate for the items coming in. So essentially what we were doing is uh, creating a faster way to return work to our frontline uh, team members. So we had that going. So uh, what we really understood at that time is that we 
needed to build on that foundation and create a real end-to-end -end capability. Uh, and to do that, what we uh, understood is we needed to solve for those customer friction points. And uh, this would be, to me, like a cross-section of any process. It doesn't matter uh, what industry you're in, uh, perhaps at least in the service space. Uh, when we get requests from customers, uh, first, the, the friction point that we would see in terms of how we get that request. How does it come in? How do we receive the data from the customer? Uh, and particularly for team member facing channels, in the case of ATB for our branches and our care center, uh, there's a lot of manual work. And, and I don't know if you've noticed that going to your bank, but uh, the process lots of times becomes about the mechanics of getting something done and not about uh, the relationship. So that's the first friction point we wanted to solve for. Secondly, rules management. So again, in the case of uh, banks, for us that means policy, process, pricing, and credit. And lots of times our rules are, are not uh, super well defined, and then they're manually enforced. And of course that creates a lot of rework uh, and sort of amb ambiguous decision making, doesn't do a good job in terms of how we manage risk and so on. Uh, and then uh, the other friction point we see with requests lots of times is how we move work. And even if these are moving digitally uh, right into our core and SAP, uh, oftentimes those requests still have to move through integration or some such thing. But for manual processes, they can go by email, uh, they can go by paper forms oftentimes, they can go through our CRM. Uh, and sometimes, uh, certainly in our case, we found that people were sending them uh, multiple different ways for the same request. Uh, and so uh, that would be another friction point that we needed to solve for. And of course, finally, how do you get that request uh, into the system and on the books? And um, again, in spite of our efforts uh, to, to transform our core banking system a few years ago in 2011, we still have some ancillary systems. And so uh, if it's manual work in the back office that goes on, lots of times that's a lot of different uh, systems that our team members have to input, which of course, uh, can be fraught with errors and so forth. So we wanted to solve uh, whatever solution we came up with. We know we wanted to solve for those uh, friction points. The other thing, though, we wanted to do with the, the solution of intelligent automation is make the solution customer-centric. And so uh, what do I mean by that? When you look across at the different types of interactions that we have with our customers across their journeys with us, um, each one of these has any number of requests that we could do. Our focus at the moment, and again, that's just based on our voice of customer and the key opportunities that we see, uh, right now we're focused in that service space. And so for us, that's over 200 different request types. And again, I, I don't know any of the corporations that uh, you guys work in, but uh, you could imagine Lots of times what that means is 200 different forms or lots of sort of complex UIs that we kind of now ask our frontline team members to navigate through, which again doesn't create a great experience. So what we kind of thought about in terms of a hypoth hypothesis with respect to AI uh, and machine learning is what if we didn't need you know, a complex UI? What if we didn't need 200 forms? What if we didn't need any forms? Maybe we just need one field. Uh, and that's what uh, we started to work on, um, you know, a little over a year ago. So, um, besides that, in terms of the solution, we were also, with respect to intelligent automations, looking to solve uh, in a way that was leveraging open architecture. And particularly with respect to AI, we know so much uh, is, is happening in this space. So we didn't want to, as an organization, get pinholed into one technology or provider or another. Uh, rather, we wanted to have some flexibility so we could try uh, different technologies based on where the market goes. And so, really, we wanted to enable an open architecture. Uh, and of course, that aligned uh, well with our strategy at ATB to uh, build through open API architecture to enable really rich uh, experiences for our customers. So those were the requirements that we kind of uh, went forward with to build an end-to-end -end intelligent automation solution. And what we came up with was uh, EVA is our front end. And this is, uh, we call this easy voice automation. Uh, EVA is built entirely on the cloud using Google Cloud Platform. Um, it's built on the Firebase stack uh, for rapid development. Uh, and essentially, the way we leverage it is we use uh, Google's cloud functions to manage user, user access and queries, a smart talk 
uh, to enable workflow and routing of requests. We uh, leverage paper, uh, TensorFlow and PaperSpace to create uh, and manage and uh, serve up tensors for our ML components. Uh, and those components, by the way, from a machine learning perspective, we're leveraging to classify, to manage our business rules, and to route the request to the right uh, place or the right uh, robot. And then finally, uh, we're actually using Firestore and Firebase. I heard someone here was working on blockchain stuff. Um, we've actually enabled a bit of a distributed database through public-private key encryption that allows us to route uh, these requests to our ro robots waiting in the back office to pick up, which we've essentially integrated through uh, JSON into uh, the cloud there. So this is uh, what we've uh, created as our front end. And you can see in terms of the capability, it's based on the premise of ask, learn, do. So you can ask uh, Eva questions uh, to get simple answers to things that your customer might be uh, wanting to know or wanting to do. And maybe it's uh, more of a how-to type inquiry, so you're actually not looking to perform work, or uh, so therefore you can learn, or you could just simply have uh, Eva do that request. So you, you might ask a how-to related question, or you might simply ask uh, Eva to do the work uh, for you. And so uh, just some examples uh, there. This is a bit of a video. You won't be able to see it too well, but uh, Eva kind of working in action. This is an example of an address change. Really uh, riveting stuff, address changes, I know. Uh, but in banks, uh, sadly, uh, we've made this pretty hard on ourselves. So uh, depending on whether you're a single or a joint customer and the types of products you have, if you're fully banked with a credit card and a, you know, an investment instrument or a credit instrument, um, being able to input addresses and making sure that we're managing all of our regulatory requirements from a know your customer perspective uh, creates some complexity. And so uh, in this instance, we're able to uh, simplify that for a team member. They can request it through chat. Evil will source all the relevant data information. It will walk uh, the, the team member in this case through that process uh, and then collect that information and then finally uh, it passes that over uh, to our processor robots uh, for fulfillment. In our case, again, we have a few different ancillary systems. So you can see here the robot logging on. Uh, we leverage uh, Blue Prism from an RPA perspective. And now it's going to go ahead and input all that uh, information into uh, SAP. So um, what was once quite a, a manual uh, and rather painful process for our customer, now we've enabled through uh, straight through end-to-end -end intelligent automation, them leveraging a number of different uh, sort of capabilities from an AI and RPA perspective. We, um, we've also started to build out other sort of capabilities that would be uh, direct customer interaction, working with our partners, and I know we have some of them here uh, from the data science team. Um, where we, we may not be leveraging Eva as our team member interface, but rather uh, interacting direct with customers. And the one that we picked to work on uh, initially is for our corporate customers. And in this case, you can see uh, what we're doing here is we, in the case of our corporate customers for their margin loan, they have to send in to us their financial statements once a month. And then we'll check their cash positions to make sure that they are aligned with the agreements and the original loan agreements and the covenants uh, that we had set up when we created their credit instruments. And so in the past, we'd have team members receive that uh, paper mail and review manually those cash positions, the receivables and the payables, and then go through a series of manual steps to calculate whether uh, they were in a line or what they needed to do to adjust up or down their credit instruments. Here you can see we're leveraging uh, Google Tesseract with some OCR capabilities. We've read that file, we've created a flat file, and now we're adjusting it in through the robots who then will uh, make the necessary updates to those credit facilities for that customer uh, if and as required, and then notify our frontline uh, relationship managers of that change uh, if needs be. So that's another end-to-end uh, -end example of uh, some of the things that we've been able to uh, put together. So as a result, as mentioned, we now have over 50 automations uh, like these two examples running uh, in production. And from a customer experience perspective, 
we're seeing on average about a 99% improvement from a turnaround time for the customer. So we're taking these requests that were pretty manual and painful for customers and for team members down from four or five days on average down to less than two or three minutes to do. Um, we are starting to measure the impact from a customer experience perspective uh, based on our customer advocacy measure. Uh, the items that we've focused on, those 50 automations that I mentioned, uh, relate to about 12% of our negative customer feedback. And so uh, we're, we're starting to see and measure a, an improvement in CAI. And uh, we're, we're also hoping to measure a reduced amount of repeat calls into our uh, care center. Certainly, uh, we've seen oh, it's minions. We've seen efficiency uh, benefits uh, in our back office, um, and with that, uh, we, you know, we we have a view that there is an opportunity for us to reinvent our operations business model in the organization. So, from a business perspective, uh, this is all about the future of work for our workforce, and um, lots of times with RPA. Uh, can be viewed as an efficiency play, and certainly, you know, it, it would be wrong to say we're not going to get any efficiencies out of this, but we've actually been able to start to cross-train a lot of our team members in our back office uh, on robotics process automation. Uh, and so uh, our view is we see a future worker in our back office area as sort of the air traffic controllers of our robots and in-flight work requests. They can monitor where bottlenecks exist or where we're seeing exceptions come up. And then they can solve for those, process the exceptions, and perhaps even improve uh, the robot's capability uh, to reduce exceptions going forward. Um, to implement this new business model, we've already consolidated our, our back office in the organization, and we've cross-trained those team members uh, not only on robotics process automation, but on lean management as an operation system management uh, perspective. And so the point being there is we're really trying to invest uh, in our people. Um, we know as we start to scale as well that you know, an operations model that leverages in part a robotics workforce uh, needs to be highly resilient. So this last year we've set up a COE uh, and we've started to implement uh, some visual management uh, capabilities. So where we can see uh, in-flight work in real time coming through uh, we manually initially with robotics controllers, but um, what we've just started to do, if you look at this, um, this guy here, is we're actually training a robot to monitor that dashboard. And so we're tracking the attack time of the requests that are coming in. And if those requests are starting to trend out of the timing that we want to be able to commit to our customers, uh, we're able to reassign robots in real time uh, to scale our workforce in an automated fashion um, quite rapidly and then send off notifications to leaders as required uh, that this has been done. So uh, we don't have that robot trained just yet, but it's, uh, it's something we're working on uh, right now, so hope to be done that piece in the next uh, month or two. So um, that's our update from an operations perspective. From an AI perspective, uh, what we really want to be able to do mo moving forward is to start to build more feature functionality and kind of declare, I guess, what I would say uh, would be AI-specific products that we can build upon to enable more direct customer self-serve options. So examples uh, would include certainly chat, uh, voice, uh, perhaps some digital avatars, um, more MLs as a service like that margining example that I, I showed to you. Um, and I think that's been one of the advantages that we have with the, the EVA use case is that we've been able to uh, kind of experiment on our team members, so to speak, which allows us to really tune and improve the accuracy of our ability to uh, capture and route work correctly uh, from a machine learning and uh, rules management perspective. So that's kind of the view of, of what we have moving forward with this technology. Um, so I would just say to kind of close on it, in summary, really, we started with a meaningful customer problem. We followed a test and learn and iterate approach, so we're using Agile. Uh, we actually took an inside out uh, approach to, to solve the end-to-end -end customer experience, and sometimes that's counterintuitive from a design thinking perspective, but I'll tell you my view and some of the FinTech uh, mm -hmm 
solutions that I've seen uh, come in, lots of times they'll take an outside in and you end up with very cool and slick user experiences for your customers on the, on the surface, but lots of manual work behind the scenes to really persist those requests for the customers into uh, the organization. And so we, we took an inside out approach to do this. Um, we're building on an open and scalable architecture. And of course, we're, we're trying to invest in our employees for the future of work. So that's uh, what I want to share with you guys. I'll, uh, I'll stop for questions. Yeah. Have you brainstormed any future products? From a robotic or an AI perspective? Well, from an AI perspective. I mean, mm. that's, that's the whole goal to, to increase the EVA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just starting that now. Uh, one of the views that we have is we want to enable EVA more self-serve. Uh, as a capability, so we'd want to be able to uh, do a lot of the automations that we've already done through voice, for an example. Um, we're, we're thinking about things like Google Duplex to, to leverage that. So uh, yeah, we, we've started to brainstorm some of those products for sure. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, in the back end, it's, it's, yeah, the, the processor robots are just RPA, that's what they are. So the Blue Prism product is more of the arms and legs of the solution, whereas Eva is where we're kind of putting the, the brains of being able to capture and route the work and make sure we've got the right business rules applied. So there's a few different uh, pieces of software that are, that are working there. But in terms of the RPA, it's, yeah, just set and uh, it'll do what you kind of tell it to do. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Sure. That's great. Wow. Okay. Awesome. We'll have to talk after. Yeah. Very good. Mm. And through the SAP, you can also say, scale, 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 right? Correct. Why not just use the API and just go through it? Yeah, I, I th so we do on some occasions use API, and so there'd be a few reasons. We, we've developed some principles, uh, Dom, that we would uh, follow on when we would want to use an API versus when we would want to use a robot. Um, so if we're looking at something that's a set and forget, we don't need to do it in you know, real time, let's say, uh, it might be more affordable for us to do through RPA. Um, so in some instances, yeah, I mean, we can go right through uh, using an API, no question. Yeah. Doing? Yeah, what was the selection process? Yeah, so we, we started based on um, sort of our voice of customer perspective. So we looked at those top sort of negative customer bits of feedback that we, we get. Uh, we have an inventory of our uh, customer facing processes and then we had a number of internal criteria that we use based on you know volumes, number of team members impacted, um, money's handled, um, efficiency certainly was uh, one of the things, and of course, like the viability uh, of RPA as a, as a solution. So there's a few criteria, but essentially, we went through a prioritization exercise, and we do that once every three months or so. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Question in the back? In terms of how we're doing that piece, yeah, yeah I unfortunately I, we don't have that example built in in Eva, um, and I know our credit team uh, is working on some models there, but I apologize, I don't have a lot of insight to uh, how they're how they're doing that. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Oh, how far have we deployed Pepper? Um, good question. So uh, that 
the Pepper work is led largely by uh, our, our LEAP team, our uh, innovation team, and I know there's some of them here tonight. Um, Pepper right now we're using for lots of our marketing engagements and we're experimenting in terms of interaction with our customers, uh, the best use cases. Um, but I would say we, you know, we haven't uh, taken it much farther than that actually to enable um, actual transactions with our customers. Uh, because there's a few things that we need to work through from a security perspective and and also I think more importantly from a customer service perspective we're learning a lot just by having Pepper in terms of the type of experience that a customer would want to have that kind of information uh, or interaction rather versus versus not yeah one in the back yeah Machine learning as a service, I, I mean, there's lots. Like I think um, certainly from a, our ability to uh, personalize and contextualize experience for customers, so that might be financial advice uh, or, or recommendations direct to customer to be able to personalize. Uh, risk is another place for sure. Um, you know, our ability to, again, further accelerate speed and quality of uh, the transactions that we're doing for customers. So there's, there's a whole host of uh, things and potential that we could, we could leverage ML as a service for, uh, for sure. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my, my knowledge of that is from the business side, so I'd have to get one of our data science guys to come up and tell you more about that. And I know we have some data science people in the room, but uh, yeah. So we'll have to, I'll connect you with some of them afterwards if I could, yeah. Uh, it's not only the parent, like how the AI is making their decisions, so mm. the ML. Mm -hmm. Oh, in terms of how those decisions, yeah. uh, the output is being made to avoid kind of black box AI? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, what we're trying to do is ensure that we're, we're documenting these things to the best that we, we can. Um, you know, as we step through and we're, we're running the models, we're, we're validating them against uh, historical records and decisions uh, to make sure that, you know, it, it aligns with our expectations. Um, so those would be like the two pieces, I guess I would say, that we're doing uh, at the moment. But as we scale, I know that's a space that, uh, you know, our, certainly our data science team is looking to uh, really unpack a lot more. Yeah. Question in the back. The workforce? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge change management effort, that's for sure. Um, what we've found is that people generally at the onset seem to be pretty exciting around the capability um, at, you know, as we begin. Uh, and then, you know, once we get through and we, we kind of hit that critical mass, there, there is a bit of a fear factor in terms of future of work and jobs and stuff like that for our team members. Um, so yeah, in all transparency, there is some nervousness there. Uh, we're just managing that with the, the most transparent communication that we can. Um, but then also I think we've, we've demonstrated uh, that we've, we've actually been able to act on transitioning people into, into new roles. Um, you know, for my team, for example, um, you know, a year ago we probably had six people working on this and now we have over 40 and half of them uh, came from our, our operations department. We were able to cross train a lot of them on some of the uh, robotics uh, work. So um, I think that, you know, when we can kind of showcase that piece, it, it kind of puts a lot of people at ease. Yeah. Other questions? No? Awesome. Good. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks very much.